Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Chapter forty two. It was now broad day, and she started again, emerging cautiously upon the highway. But there was no need for caution, not a soul was at hand, and Tess went onward with fortitude, her recollection of the bird's silent endurance of their night of agony impressing upon her the relativity of sorrows and the tolerable nation of her own, if she could once rise high enough to despise opinion, but that she could not do so long as it was held by Clare. She reached Chalk Newton, and breakfasted at an inn where several young men were troublesomely complimentary to her good looks. Somehow she felt hopeful, for was it not possible that her husband also might say these same things to her even yet? She was bound to take care of herself on the chance of it, and to keep off these casual lovers. To this end Tess resolved to run no further risks from her appearance. As soon as she got out of the village she entered a thicket, and took from her basket one of the oldest field gowns, which she had never put on even at the dairy, never since she had worked among the stubble at Marlott. She also, by a felicitous thought, took a handkerchief from her bundle, and tied it round her face under her bonnet, covering her chin and half her cheeks and temples, as if she was suffering from toothache. Then, with her little scissors, by the aid of a pocket-looking-glass, she mercilessly nipped her eyebrows off, and thus insured against aggressive admiration, she went on her uneven way. "'What a moppet of a maid!' said the next man who met her to a companion. Tears came into her eyes for very pity of herself as she had heard him. "'But I don't care,' she said. "'Oh, no, I don't care. I'll always be ugly now, because Angel is not here, and I have nobody to take care of me. My husband that was is gone away, and never will love me any more but I love him just the same, and hate all other men, and like to make em think scornfully of me." Thus Tess walks on, a figure which is part of the landscape, a field-woman, pure and simple, in winter guise, a grey serge cap, a red woollen cravat, a stuff skirt covered by a whitey-brown rough wrapper, and buff leather gloves. Every thread of that old attire has become faded and thin under the stroke of raindrops, the burn of sunbeams, and the stress of winds. There is no sign of young passion in her now. The maiden's mouth is cold, fold over simple fold, binding her head. Inside this exterior, over which the eye might have roved, as over a thing scarcely precipitant, almost inorganic, there was the record of a pulsating life which had learned too well for its years of the dust and ashes of things, of the cruelty of lust and the fragility of love. Next day the weather was bad, but she trudged on, the honesty, directness, and impartiality of elemental enmity disconcerting her but little. Her object being a winter's occupation and a winter's home, there was no time to lose. Her experience of short hirings had been such that she was determined to accept no more. Thus she went forward from farm to farm in the direction of the place whence Marian had written to her, which she determined to make use of as a last shift only, its rumoured stringencies being the reverse of tempting. First she inquired for the lighter kinds of employment, and, as acceptance of any variety of those grew hopeless, applied for the less light, till, Beginning with the dairy and poultry tendance that she liked best, she ended with the heavy and coarse pursuits which she liked least—work on arable land, work of such roughness, indeed, as she would never have deliberately volunteered for. Towards the second evening she reached the irregular chalk tableland or plateau, bosomed with semi-globular tumuli, as if Sybil the many-breasted was supinely extended there which stretched between the valley of her birth and the valley of her love. Here the air was dry and cold, and the long cart roads were blown white and dusty within a few hours after rain. There were few trees, or none, 
those that would have grown in the hedges being mercilessly plashed down with the quickset by the tenant-farmers, the natural enemies of tree, brush, and brake. In the middle distance ahead of her she could see the summits of Bulbarrow and Nettlecombe Tout, and they seemed friendly. They had a low and unassuming aspect from this upland, though as approached on the other side from Blackmoor in her childhood they were as lofty bastions against the sky. Southerly, at many miles' distance, and over the hills and ridges coastward, she could discern a surface like polished steel. It was the English Channel, at a point far out towards France. Before her, in a slight depression, were the remains of a village. She had, in fact, reached Flintcomb Ash, the place of Marion's sojourn. There seemed to be no help for it. Hither she was doomed to come. The stubborn soil around her showed plainly enough that the kind of labour in demand here was of the roughest kind. But it was time to rest from searching, and she resolved to stay, particularly as it began to rain. At the entrance to the village was a cottage whose gable jutted into the road, and before applying for a lodging she stood under its shelter and watched the evening close in. "'Who would think I was Mrs. Angel Clare?' she said. The wall felt warm to her back and shoulders, and she found that immediately within the gable was the cottage fireplace, the heat of which came through the bricks. She warmed her hands upon them, and also put her cheek, red and moist with the drizzle, against their comforting surface. The wall seemed to be the only friend she had. She had so little wish to leave it that she could have stayed there all night. Tess could hear the occupants of the cottage, gathered together after their day's labour, talking to each other within, and the rattle of their supper-plates was also audible but in the village street she had seen no soul as yet. The solitude was at last broken by the approach of one feminine figure, who, though the evening was cold, wore the print gown and the tilt-bonnet of summer-time. Tess instinctively thought it might be Marian, and when she came near enough to be distinguishable in the gloom, surely enough it was she. Marian was even stouter and redder in the face than formerly and decidedly shabbier in attire. At any previous period of her existence Tess would hardly have cared to renew the acquaintance in such conditions, but her loneliness was aggressive, and she responded readily to Marian's greeting. Marian was quite respectful in her inquiries, but seemed much moved by the fact that Tess should still continue in no better condition than at first, though she had dimly heard of the separation. "'Tess, Mrs. Clare, the dear wife of dear he! And is it really so bad as this, my child? Why is your comely face tied up in such a way? Anybody been beaten he? Not he!' "'No, no, no! I merely did it not to be clipsed or called, Marian.' She pulled off in disgust a bandage which could suggest such wild thoughts. "'And you've got no collar on!' Tess had been accustomed to wear a little white collar at the dairy. "'I know it, Marian. "'You've lost it travelling?' "'I've not lost it. "'The truth is I don't care anything about my looks, so I didn't put it on.' "'And you don't wear your wedding ring?' "'Yes, I do, but not in public. "'I wear it round my neck on a ribbon.' I don't wish people to think who I am by marriage, or that I am married at all. It would be so awkward while I leave my present life." Marian paused. "'But you be a gentleman's wife, and it seems hardly fair that you should live like this.' "'Oh, yes, it is. Quite fair, though I am very unhappy.' "'Well, well, he married you, and you can be unhappy.' Wives are unhappy sometimes, from no fault of their husbands, from their own. You've got no faults, dearie, that I'm sure of, and he's none, so it must be something outside ye both. Marian, dear Marian, 
Will you do me a good turn without asking questions? My husband has gone abroad, and somehow I have overrun my allowance, so that I have had to fall back upon my own work for a time. Do not call me Mrs. Clare, but Tess, as before. Do they want a hand there? Oh, yes. They'll take one always, because few care to come. Tis a starve-acre place. Corn and swedes are all they grow. Though I be here myself, I fear tis a pity for such as you to come. But you used to be as good a dairy woman as I. Yes, but I've got out of that since I took to drink. Lord, that's the only comfort I've got now. But if you engage, you'll be set swede hacking. That's what I be doing, and you won't like it. Oh, anything. Will you speak for me? You will do better by speaking for yourself. Very well. Now, Marian, remember nothing about him if I get the place. I don't wish to bring his name down to the dirt. Marian, who was really a trustworthy girl, though of course a grain than Tess, promised anything she asked. This is pay night, she said, and if you were to come with me you would know at once. I be real sorry that you are not happy, but tis because he's away I know. You couldn't be unhappy if he was here, even if he gid thee no money, even if he used you like a drudge. That's true. I could not. They walked on together, and soon reached the farmhouse, which was almost sublime in its dreariness. There was not a tree within sight. There was not at this season a green pasture, nothing but fallow and turnips everywhere, in large fields divided by hedges, plashed to unrelieved levels. Tess waited outside the door of the farmhouse till the group of workfolk had received their wages, and then Marian introduced her. The farmer himself, it appeared, was not at home, but his wife, who represented him this evening, made no objection to hiring Tess on her agreeing to remain till Old Lady Day. Female field labour was seldom offered now, and its cheapness made it profitable for tasks which women could perform as readily as men. Having signed the agreement there was nothing more for Tess to do at present than to get a lodging, and she found one in the house at whose gable wall she had warmed herself. It was a poor subsistence that she had insured, but it would afford a shelter for the winter at any rate. That night she wrote to inform her parents of her new address in case a letter should arrive at Marlott from her husband. But she did not tell them of the sorriness of her situation. It might have brought reproach upon him. End of chapter 42